philosophy of science. I'm under a new name because I'm using another device. My computer is out of order temporarily, but I hope we'll soon uh, switch to former variant. But it's, uh, I think it's not so important. Um, the most important thing is that the sound is okay. And um, we have a new theme. Uh, if you follow the program, today is the fifth lesson and uh, uh, the, it is devoted to Immanuel Kant. Um, I yeah. have already uh, told you that this will be the topic of our today's discussion. And um, well, I can say for those who don't know this name that it, Immanuel Kant Immanuel Kant is uh, one of the greatest German philosophers. He uh, was uh, lived in the 18th century. He was born in 1724 and died in 1804. So he lived uh, 80 years. So he died quite an elderly person. He was born in uh, a very um, how to say, devoted or uh, theatistic, they say, uh, family, Protestants. And most of his life, he lived in Königsberg, which is now Kaliningrad, Russia. Do you know this city, Kaliningrad? It has a university, which is named after Immanuel Kant. So in Kaliningrad, you, you if you know a little bit of Russian geography, um, please uh, um, just uh, sort of imagine the map of Russia and you will see that he, there is a certain enclave between Lithuania and Belarus and Poland and it's called Kaliningradske Oblast or Kaliningrad district or Kaliningrad region. Um, which was former uh, territory of Eastern Prussia and belonged to Germany before the Second World War. So after the Second World War, uh, it was given, this territory was given to Russia. Uh, and uh, Königsberg was a, a German city for, I think, uh, almost 800 years. And then it beca became a Russian city. The, so the uh, tomb of Immanuel Kant is still preserved in Kaliningrad and uh, there is a museum devoted to Kant and the university, as I already told you, is named after Kant. So Kant is somehow connected with Russia. Um, now, well, uh, of course, in the 18th century, uh, it was a German city and it had a university with four faculties, um, faculty of philosophy, faculty of law, faculty of medicine, and faculty of theology. Typical European university with four faculties. You would ask, where's the faculty of physics? Well, physics and mathematics, it was part of uh, uh, philosophy because philosophy comprised seven liberal arts uh, and including arithmetic and geometry, astronomy and music, also grammar, uh, rhetorics and uh, logic. So uh, in frames of this uh, faculty of arts or faculty of philosophy, um, well, people could study um, e exact sciences, but um, of course, in the 19th century, this uh, um, uh, type of education was considered obsolete. And when uh, um, the Prussian government decided to open the university in Berlin in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, I think in 1880, in 18, in 1808, uh, it was already uh, had more faculties than and uh, especially the uh, stress was put on uh, cultivating exact sciences. Uh, 
but this is a new type of the university. Berlin University is a new type of the university. Also Moscow University can be considered a new type of the university. It was also formed, it was formed in the 18th century and it had, for example, a faculty of history and literature. So uh, historical philological faculty, which was new uh, because it was neither theology, nor philosophy, nor law, nor medicine. So, um, so things are developing. Now we have faculties of psychology, faculties of politology, faculty of computer sciences and uh, many others. So, well, uh, this is important because we'll speak about Königsberg University where um, Kant spent almost all his life and all his um, academic career was connected with that university. Um, well, uh, first, um, his first work was devoted to um, astronomy. It was uh, uh, the theory of heavens, it was called. Well, uh, at that time, uh, there already there was a breakthrough in understanding of what is our galaxy. Perhaps uh, you know that our galaxy is uh, a spiral galaxy, one of the of many that exist in uh, the universe. And uh, well, but of, because we are part of it, so we see it uh, like in a certain um, projection and we see it as a Milky Way. You, see, you understand, yes? So because we are part of this galaxy and we are in the outer uh, spiral um, oh, sort of, uh, um, yes, we are in the outskirts of uh, our galaxy. So if we lived in the center of our galaxy, perhaps we, we wouldn't survive because of uh, and the heat and uh, light and uh, excessive uh, radiation, cosmic radiation. But we live in the relatively, uh, I would say, safe uh, outskirts. And that's why we continue to study history and philosophy of science. It's all due to our privileged position in the outskirts of our galaxy. Now, of course, it's just a knowledge <laughs> that is given at schools, but at the time of Kant, it was brand new conception of uh, galaxy. And uh, the first, uh, one of the first models was proposed by a certain Swiss uh, amateur, uh, Lambert, who uh, just proposed this, uh, um, how to say, model of the galaxy. That galaxy is like in uh, anti-symmetrical towards the solar system. In what sense? In our solar system, the bright sun, the source of light, is in the center of the solar system and is the heaviest. And the planets, uh, which are dark, which have no, which are not source of light, except uh, reflected light, they move around the bright star, which is our sun. Uh, what Lambert suggested is that um, in the galaxy, the stars being bright move around a certain very heavy dark body. So in the center of our galaxy, according to the hypothesis of Lambert, is a dark body which cannot be seen, but it is very heavy and uh, a center of attraction for all the stars. So the stars move circularly around some uh, heavy body. So this was, uh, uh, and it was also proposed that such galaxies exist, other such galaxies exist in our universe. So universe is full of galaxies. That, of course, that idea fascinated <laughs> Kant and he proposed also um, and this is one a, um, idea. The second idea is the idea of the origin of the solar system. 
And here Kant proposed the hypothesis that our solar system is built out of a, a certain nebula, which is sort of um, was condensed and part of this condensation were the planets and the sun. So this is, uh, uh, this was later, uh, um, this hypothesis was later improved by uh, Pierre Simon Laplace. And so it is known as a Kant Laplace hypothesis of the origin of the solar system. So these were the first steps of Immanuel Kant in science. Then followed uh, his interest in other subjects. So uh, Kant was polymath. So he was not only, his interest didn't focus on astronomy. He also, um, uh, after he became acquainted with uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a famous uh, French philosopher, he decided that his interest should be changed to the study of man. Okay, what is man? So he posed four, later he posed four questions, which he considered four most important questions of philosophy. The first question is, what can I know? The second question is, what should I do? So it is a moral question, what should I do? The third question is, for what can I uh, sort of, um, hope for, what I can hope for. It means in the future life. And this is the question of religion. And the fourth question, perhaps most important for Kant is what is man? So he considered this question the most important. Uh, that's why he, during all his career in Königsberg University, he uh, uh, read a course of lectures on anthropology. That is, uh, the answer on the question, what is man? Anthropology from anthropos, which means man in Greek. So anthropology. If you want to know what is man to find the answer to this question, then you can, uh, you should study anthropology. This anthropology was later translated from German into French by a celebrate French philosopher, Michel Foucault who is considered a postmodernist. Uh, well, he, of course, Michel Foucault is known for other works and he lived in the 20th century, but his first steps in his academic career was his translation of Kant, Kant, Kant's anthropology from uh, German into French. It is also translated into Russian. Also, uh, while studying the question of man, um, Kant uh, put attention to aesthetical questions. What is beauty? And what is sublime? And what is the difference between beautiful and sublime? Is it interesting for you, beautiful and sublime? Can you follow, uh, you understand sublime? Sublime is uh, like, uh, uh, well, which creates very high, feelings okay beautiful uh, well we can say a beautiful woman but we cannot say a sublime woman we can say a sublime view or uh, say when you uh, visit the alps or other mountains uh, covered with snow then we can say oh the, the 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 view is sublime also sublime it can be the ocean or even some disasters like earthquakes, we can say they are sublime because they lead our thoughts to such, uh, well, uh, questions as eternity, God, uh, death, uh, heavenly justice, and so on. So these are called sublime. Beautiful is uh, when we see a meadow covered with the flowers, then we say the meadow is beautiful, okay? If we see a beautiful young man or a beautiful young woman or a beautiful child, uh, we say beautiful because child cannot be associated with the danger or with death or with uh, um, uh, some, uh, well, uh, 
other uh, questions which uh, as, are associated with uh, um, like eternal truths. Well, we just um, also when we speak about animals, we also can see what a beautiful cat we can say. Oh, well, now we have a, a, a lot of synonyms in English also for beautiful. But uh, this was the, uh, also the topic of Kant's investigations. And Kant wrote a, another book uh, on the beautiful and the sublime. Uh, oh, in German, of course. Uh, it, in German, when we say beautiful, we say schön. schön. If somebody studied German, so you perhaps know this word schön. And uh, sublime is erhabene, erhabene. This means uh, uh, just uh, situated high above. So just taken somewhere up upwards. So when uh, we speak about uh, sublime, our uh, thoughts move uh, higher, okay? To higher questions. Well, uh, this was the beginning of Kant's career. And at that time we find Kant very optimistic, very enthusiastic about knowledge and about uh, possibilities of man and about man's future. And also optimistic in theology, he uh, thought that he had found a very good um, proof of the existence of God with which he ended his book on uh, the history of heavens. But then something changed with Kant. And so the topic of our present discussion, if you follow exactly the program, will be the Kant's gnosiology or Kant's theory of knowledge. And this is the answer to the first question, which is what can I know? So this question uh, deserved much attention. And here Kant uh, made certain evolution, uh, underwent certain, so certain evolution from um, optimism to skepticism. So after 1781, when appeared the masterpiece of Kant, the critique of pure reason, um, some, we, we say that Kant entered a critical period or post-critical period. So this critique is uh, like a name of the period. And so when we speak about the early works of Kant, we speak about pre-critical Kant, okay? So um, uh, the, his, all his uh, um, career, academic career and all his creative uh, career is uh, divided into two parts, critical, pre-critical and critical or post-critical. So uh, the year which divides these two parts is uh, 1781. So you can easily calculate um, and see that at that time Kant was uh, uh, approximately 60 years old. Well, exactly 27. So uh, this is a quite a, uh, I think uh, this is quite a, like a period for Kant. So uh, for everybody. So 57 is, a, a, is an age of maturity. I think nobody of you listening to me now has uh, reached 57 years. Well, if, if I'm mistaken, please let me know. If you are already 27 or older, please put up your hand. Um, but I think that no hands will be put up. Yes, you are all younger uh, than, uh, ah, you are 20, 57. No, 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 I'm not 57. <laughs> Yeah, no. unfortunately. I'm 29, okay. like 30 is running. 39. No, 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 30, 30 is running. 30, yeah, 30 is running. I'm, I'm 23. 23, 23 yeah, 24. Well, uh, so I'm, I'm 20. 63. I'm 63, so I can mm -hmm. imagine uh, what is to be 20, 57. So when Kant was 57 years old, he became a little bit skeptical. I, maybe I also 
my evolution also leads me to certain skepticism. For example, skepticism in the abilities of people to study. It seems to me that the 95% of what I'm speaking about is not understood by my students. This is skepticism, you understand? So I become a skeptic and a, a little bit cynical also. This is a, a misanthropic. Uh, so this is the consequences of the old age. Look at your parents and grandparents and you will understand everything, okay? So, uh, well, so Kant is entering into this new period and uh, he focuses from now on, he focuses on the problems of knowledge. What is to know? How knowledge is possible? And uh, here we come on this question of no man and phenomenon. Phenomenon, phenomenon and noumenon, okay? What is this? These are two very important, uh, I would say, uh, notions. Phenomenon, what is uh, phenomenon? Phenomenon is... Yes, I, phenomenon. I have a, a question in the, yes. let's say, the, the, the distinction between the faculties of intellectual thought and the Mm, sensible receptivity was already present in the pre-critic period? No, not yet, because you, I, I've told you that in pre-critical period, Kant was focus, focused himself on other subjects. First of all, it was his book on astronomy, uh, which is, uh, of course, here, uh, um, uh, well, here Kant didn't put these questions of whether it is possible to know the universe. Uh, he was very optimistic. He even po postulated the, 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 uh, the planets are inhabited by other um, rational beings like humans. So he deeply believed that our universe is populated by reasonable creatures, okay? So this is a part of optimistic, or I would say even utopian view, you understand? Then his, yeah. uh, interest, his interest in beautiful and sublime, his interest in aesthetics also shows uh, that uh, he he's, uh, uh, well, he, here we, uh, he's not focused on so subjectivity of uh, beautiful and sublime, but he wants to stress something objective that for example, uh, say uh, high mountains or in India or say Jomalungma or Kailas are objectively sublime, not that they are subjectively sublime only for Indians and that Europeans um, experience no sense of sublime when they enter uh, the when they see these mountains or climb them. No, uh, Kant wants to find something objective in um, in aesthetics. He's uh, um, and uh, only in his critic of pure reason he comes to this notion of subjectivity of our knowledge. Also, this is not subjectivity that is. Uh, peculiar to say one individual, for example, uh, people with a certain, uh, how to say, Daltonism, for example, or other, um, say, uh, disorders of perception. No, Kant wants to um, see the situation of man as man versus phenomena as phenomena. So he puts a question which is, um, uh, seems to um, remind us of the questions of René Descartes. Uh, you remember that Descartes was um, in his work, Meditations on First Philosophy, the first meditation is devoted to doubt, universal doubt, okay? So we doubt our sensual experience because for example, Descartes says that people who whose legs or arms are amputated, uh, feel the pain in the amputated um, members, okay? 
So this is, uh, of course, phantom pains, okay? Phantom pains, you understand? What is that? So the same with the, um, um, when you put, uh, say, a spoon in a cup, in a, in a glass of water, the spoon seems to be crooked, you understand? Because the uh, refraction of light is different in water and in air. But if you just take the spoon out of the glass, you will see that nothing happened with it. It, it was not crooked or broken. It's uh, just as before. So the illusion is caused only by uh, this, uh, how to say, um, by light and uh, the propagation, the, the, the peculiarities of the propagation of light, okay? Now, um, also Descartes con uh, suggested the idea that perhaps some uh, evil demon can cause by his, uh, uh, how to say, obsession uh, spells, he can cause in us some feelings, well, uh, and, uh, or some illusions. And we cannot know whether we are sort of, uh, uh, how to say, tempted by some demonic creature or not. Well, it's part of the influence of the Jesuit education, I think, on Descartes, because in spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, much stress is put on this, uh, how to say, discernment of spirits. So, but with Kant, of course, uh, uh, there were other sources of doubts, not uh, spiritual ones. Uh, he was, uh, I think, quite an unfamiliar with the uh, uh, Ignatius of Loyola and Catholic uh, spiritual uh, exercises. Well, uh, but nevertheless, he of course read Descartes and also he read another philosopher, David Hume, a Scottish philosopher of the 18th century, David Hume. We'll speak about him later, maybe during our next um, seminar. So you please be sort of prepared to speak. If you don't know this name, David Hume, I will write you in chat, okay? Uh, chat is now a little bit far from me because uh, I'm using iPad and uh, I put it uh, far from me, okay? Now I will, ah, okay, here. Um, okay, so this David Hume is very important. Please pay attention because we'll have next classes will be devoted to David Hume and the mm, uh, starting of positivism. So uh, now David Hume is uh, important today because he influenced Kant and he influenced him being skeptic himself. David Hume was a representative of the so-called skeptical philosophy. He, by his influence, he, uh, well, uh, he exerted the influence on Kant and led Kant also to a kind of a skepticism. Well, Kant didn't want to remain in the skeptical position. He wanted to get out of it, but he understood um, that the uh, arguments of Hume are very serious. So they are to be pondered and uh, one should find an answer to these um, arguments because uh, Hume uh, was skeptical to a certain degree that he even denied <laughs> the objectivity of the notion of cause and effect. He considered that our notion of cause, you understand cause, is uh, just uh, our, um, like uh, product, product of our human experience and imagination. For example, if you observe that the sun rises after the cock cries, then you can come to the conclusion that the cry of a cock or a song of a cock is the reason or is the cause of the rising of the sun, okay? So uh, this is a typical mistake which Hume um, defined as 
post hoc ergo propter hoc. Well, I think uh, the Spanish people can understand it. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. This means after that means because of that. This is a typical logical mistake. If something happens after something, it's not obligatory that what happened before is the cause of what happened after. So Hume insisted that most of our mistakes are due to this uh, sort of uh, logical uh, mistake uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. And he thought that our idea of cause, or notion of cause, is the product of this mistake. Okay. This is a skeptical position of David Hume. We'll speak about that later. Now, with Kant, Kant wanted to analyze the question. So he put sort of the um, sensual experience and his knowledge to the, to the, um, like to the task or just, uh, I would say, uh, questioned it, you see, uh, sort of brought it in a certain court. That's why it's called critical because crisis or uh, is a crisis is a Greek word which means justice and court. So um, you understand that uh, not justice, but uh, how to say uh, sentence of the court. So uh, uh, crisis, if you analyze the etymology of the word crisis or critical, uh, you will see that it comes to a Greek word which means. Uh, like seat of justice or court or something like that. Well, now uh, the uh, sort of, uh, we can say that Kant asked sort of uh, beg, or we say begged, no begged, but led our reason to certain court where he was questioned on his uh, pretensions to have exact knowledge. And uh, so he, uh, re our reason was asked whether your knowledge is certain and on what is it is based. And if it is based only on our notion of the phenomena, then uh, Kant says it is not enough to make certain conclusions because phenomena are not stable. They sort of come and go. And we should come, if we want to have a certain knowledge, we should come to noumena. This is things in themselves. You see, this, uh, this is a, also a term or a notion de de developed by Kant. In, in German, it is Ding an sich, which means think in itself. And uh, this is, should be the proper no object of our certain knowledge. But what we have, what we possess is only Ding für uns in German or in English, think for us. So for example, I observe some students. Well, um, I, 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 I see that there are 16 students following me, okay? Well, some have their cameras switched on, some have their cameras switched off. But if, even if you switch on the camera, I cannot see your thoughts, your inner feelings, your attitude to what I'm speaking about. I'm not sure that you understand what I'm speaking about. And I'm, sure, I'm not sure that you will remember it after a year, for example, okay? And I don't know what impression is caused by my words. So partly you are things in themselves for me, you understand? Yeah, like uh, what later in uh, the theory of informatics is called the black box, okay? You know this uh, notion, black box. So you only have some signals which you uh, send to this black box and then you have some reactions from that black box. And you should, from these reactions to your signals, you can imagine what is there in that 
Well, you remember this Turing test also. This is a good example of, of the things in themselves. Turing test. Uh, you, you don't know uh, who, who is answering you, a man or a computer. And, but you can put questions. Uh, and by answers which you receive, you should sort of um, judge uh, whether this is a computer or this is man, okay? So you can put questions, you will receive some answers, and then you should, uh, because you don't know. And sometimes it's difficult to, for example, if you play chess with a computer or with a man, also in part in frames of a Turing test. To say, make the first move. If you play white, you can move the checker um, uh, or from E2 to E4. So the computer will answer you, yes, some, uh, other, make some other move. And you will never understand whether you play with a computer or you play with a real man, okay? In a, this, this test, uh, you will not be able to pass, okay? So there are some difficulties in understanding things in themselves. And also it's difficult to understand what is objectively space and time, because we cannot imagine space other than three-dimensional. This is our abilities, you see? We cannot imagine four-dimensional uh, space. Oh, well, we can mathematically, we can sort of develop a um, contradiction free theory of four dimensional or n dimensional space. You see, also we can uh, uh, form the uh, theory of complex numbers, for example. But we cannot, I cannot show you i uh, apples, i being a square root of minus one, okay? I cannot show you, I can show you three apples, 10 apples, okay? Or 10, five fingers, but I cannot show you the complex number of fingers, okay? Or irrational number of fingers, okay? So this is all that only can exist uh, mathematically in some concepts, but not in your imagination. So Kant says this is the limits. Our, uh, our mind is, cannot uh, um, sort of um, have an, a, another idea of space uh, and other than Euclidean three-dimensional flat space, okay? The same with time. We cannot imagine time being stopped or time being sort of, um, well, how to say, created. So what, is, uh, what was before time was created? This we cannot understand because what we see is time. What, all th that we understand, we understand through time and in time. This is our limitation, okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, also when we uh, try to understand um, the big 